music is Schaffer können sicher weiden by J.S. Bach, arranged and played on the mandolins, oboe, and bass by Marco Cera. And this is Sam Biagetti of Historian Splaining, a historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. And this video is Red, White, and Royal Blue, a historian's analysis. Introduction, I know I owe you an explanation. So some of you watching right now might be regular listeners to my podcast and know a bit about the things I've talked about from the Middle Ages, early modern history, sometimes contemporary politics, the British royal family, the British monarchy. Others might be fans of the movie who are just seeing and hearing from me for the first time. So just to give a little bit of context, my podcast, which I've been producing for several years, is overwhelmingly audio lectures. And I only recently started experimenting with making videos. And I started last year with a series on the history of architecture. You can see here that's an image of me talking and gesticulating about my favorite medieval building, which is Saint Chapelle. But I've never done a video about a movie before. This is the first time, although I have spoken a few times about movies, and it's common for a lot of history podcasts to talk about movies from the perspective of accuracy, right? Are they historically accurate or inaccurate? And that's not really what I have focused on. I'm more interested in how movies show the process of myth-making, right? Of people making, defining narratives to make sense of the world around them. And that's the kind of movie I, am, I gravitate towards. Two films that I have discussed and analyzed in some detail are The Green Knight and It's a Wonderful Life. So The Green Knight, of course, is based on a story from the Arthurian mythos, and It's a Wonderful Life can be seen as kind of a quintessential American myth, a myth of the American middle class. Furthermore, I think you can see certain common themes in those movies and the one I'm going to talk about now, Red, White, and Royal Blue. All of them deal in some way with young men coming of age, trying to find their place in the world, prove themselves. There are also other particular points of similarity. You know, the Green Knight deals with royalty and the relationship of someone to a king and how that presents challenges for their life. The Green Knight centers on Sir Gawain, who is the nephew of King Arthur. Of course, Red, White, and Royal Blue deals with the grandson of a king. And when it comes to It's a Wonderful Life, that one is, of course, a different setting, but Red, White, and World Blue also is about America and about status anxiety and about historical crossroads, the future who will lead America and define America. And it also is similar in the sense that it's a movie that is commonly seen as very corny and sappy, and for that reason is not taken seriously and is overlooked. And particularly, I think, the great depth and complexity and layers in that movie are often overlooked because of its sort of corny image. Now, as for this one, Red, White, and Royal Blue, it was produced by Amazon Studios and came out on August 11th, 2023. So it's still fairly new as I'm recording this. So this video is the beginning of an intended series analyzing this movie from various different perspectives. The series is intended for people who have watched the movie, right? It's not going to make a lot of sense, and it's going to give a lot of things away if you haven't already seen the movie. But for this introduction, just in case anyone isn't aware, this is a gay romance on the international theme, right? The question of differences and comparisons between America and the old world. And specifically, it is about a putative love affair between the son of the U.S. president and a prince of Great Britain. So escapist fantasy, a fun comedy, but one that can easily be seen to have political overtones. And it might surprise some people that I would want to do a long multi-part analysis of this movie because, again, it's seen as sort of a corny, sappy, light rom-com. And that is true. You know, that's a valid way of looking at it. But much like with It's a Wonderful Life, there is tremendous complexity and there is an especially deep and dense web of symbolism, subtext, and allusion woven into this movie in often a very deceptive sort of way beneath what appears to be just sort of a sappy Hollywood veneer. And 
this makes it a gold mine for analysis and commentary and also for reflection on the world and the time that it comes from. My listeners may know I've been producing a series on the history of the United States and 100 objects where I try to take actual artifacts, physical objects, and examine them for what they show about the place and the time, the world that they come from. So I hope to be able to use this movie as a kind of artifact of the present to show the current dilemmas around the legitimacy of politics, of monarchy versus liberal democracy, sex and sexuality, and also art and aesthetics. What makes for a valid or valuable piece of art? What sort of style or form is art supposed to take in order to be taken seriously? So you could say that's kind of the final meta question I hope to get to. So just to explain a bit about where this movie came from, it's based on a book, a novel of the same title, written by a young American author named Casey McQuiston from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who identifies as a Southern Democrat in their politics and as non-binary in their gender identity. This book, as published in 2019, is 421 pages long. It is practically a tome. It is very rich and detailed. Whatever other strengths or weaknesses one might see in it, it is very rich and the author really pays close attention to historical allusion and context and especially to the sense of a sort of gay past that has to be constantly recovered and reconstructed. So all of that is very much woven into the book. Despite its great length, It was a huge commercial success, so it appeared on the New York Times bestseller list when it first came out in 2019. Then after some months, it faded out, but then came back again in 2020, as many people gravitated towards it as a source of fun escapist fiction for the pandemic. And one of the avid fans who gravitated towards this book was a young American playwright named Matthew Lopez, who had come to prominence over the course of the 2010s through a series of plays taking place some in in the present in contemporary times and some at various points in American history. So he too is a writer who's very conscious of the past and how the past is brought to bear on the present. It happens that his most successful and noted play was the most recent one to be produced, also in 2019, as it happened. And it's called The Inheritance, and it deals with a group of various gay men in New York of different social classes and generations during and after the AIDS crisis. So it too deals with similar themes of recovering and reconstructing a gay past for the present and for the future. And it deals a lot with the question of who is going to carry on the sense of gay history, especially after so much of an entire generation of gay men was wiped out by AIDS. The inheritance takes place in contemporary times. So it goes through the time of the election of Trump. However, the basic plot line and most of the characters are closely patterned on those of the novel Howard's End, a British novel written by E.M. Forrester between 1908 and 1910. And Forrester was also a gay author who was only out among friends and peers, never came out publicly. But Howard's End deals with the complicated relationship between two families in Britain in the early 1900s. And I'm going to talk about that a bit because of how then it reflects on the way this movie was adapted and brought to life. So it deals with two families, the Schlegels and the Wilcoxes, the Schlegels being a young, progressive, forward-looking family who live in a, a cosmopolitan, fashionable part of London. And they sort of make improbable friends with the Wilcoxes, who come from the traditional rural English gentry and who have a very conservative outlook. And a lot of the book is about the tension between what these two families represent, two faces of England, in a sense, the the past and the future. And that is encapsulated by a dispute over who will inherit the Wilcox's country house called Howard's End. In a sense, that can be seen as symbolizing the question of who will inherit England. And if you consider this is 
Matthew Lopez's favorite novel. It's also what happens to be among my favorites, certainly among my top three. It makes sense that he would have seen resonances in Red, White, and Royal Blue, where you can see similar questions about continuity, connection to the past, and also the need for a sense of belonging and security. In the novel, as well as in the movie, Alex, the character Alex's attachment to his childhood home in Austin is symbolized by the house key that he keeps always around his neck, sometimes even during sex, and which draws in Henry's attention and fascination. And you can see the key is representing this sense of security and belonging that Henry, ironically, although he belongs to this ancient institution, that he does not have and does not feel in the royal family and that he hopes to find in Alex. And this allusion is finally made explicit in the movie, when we see in Henry's bedroom, we see Henry in bed reading Howard's End. So it seems from interviews, it seems that Matthew Lopez uh, loved the book and quickly became determined to make the movie from it. And he learned that Amazon Studios had acquired the movie rights to the book. And reportedly he hounded them until they broke down and agreed to commission him to make the film. And he started this process early on by casting the main characters. And it seems he was really insistent that they had to have exactly the right actors to play these two characters. So he cast these two Schmendricks, who you see in this picture. On the right is Nicholas Galitzine, a British actor of Greek and Russian heritage, who was cast to play Henry. And that was done, it seems, very early on. And then it took longer, much longer search to find Taylor Zakar Perez to play Alex. And he's an American actor from Chicago, from a large Latino and Middle Eastern family. Both of these actors had appeared in films before. Nicholas Galitzine had been in various art house sort of movies like High Strung and Taylor Zakar Perez in The Kissing Booth. But neither one was a big, widely known star. Both of them were pretty new and unknown. And when the cast was assembled, really the only big names are Uma Thurman, who played the president, and Stephen Fry, who plays the King of Great Britain, sort of opposite numbers. But those are still relatively small roles. Now, in addition, of course, to the cast, Lopez assembled a production team with some interesting and notable personalities. One part of the team who has garnered a certain amount of attention and praise and who's been interviewed on podcasts is Robbie Taylor Hunt, the intimacy coordinator. So that's a relatively new role in filmmaking. Some of you might not have heard of it before, but it's a sort of specialized assistant director who is brought in specifically to help actors deal with physically intimate scenes, sex and otherwise, to make them comfortable and also to help them bring these scenes to life convincingly. And he's received a lot of credit and a lot of praise for what people see as the highly convincing and realistic physical chemistry between the main characters. Now, another important part of the team who hasn't been mentioned so much, very rarely, is the director of photography, Stephen Goldblatt, who is a highly accomplished and respected cinematographer who has had two Oscar nominations, who has worked with foremost directors like Francis Ford Coppola and Mike Nichols. And it happens, too, that he did the cinematography for the HBO production of Angels in America, which is another sort of grand epic drama, a lot like The Inheritance, a grand epic drama about gay life during the AIDS crisis. So perhaps because of that work, that might be why Lopez was inspired to bring him on. But I mention him partly because a lot of people have commented on this movie, saying it, it looks like a Hallmark movie or a Lifetime movie. They see the visual style as kind of cheap uh, or glossy, which is understandable. But at the same time, I think there is a lot of subtlety and a lot of care and thought put into how the movie was filmed and the imagery that we see on screen, which can be easily overlooked, right, if you just look at the bright colors, you know, and the corny material. So filming was done entirely in Great Britain over the summer of 2022. 
And for one thing, reportedly, the two main stars got on smashingly. Uh, they made fast friends. There are pictures, videos from the set that have become kind of notorious among the large fan community, often where it's hard to tell whether the two actors are in character or just being themselves messing around. So it seems that the, the comfort, the chemistry that they had translated over into the screen easily. So the movie, as I mentioned, was released August 11th, 2023, and it happens that that was during the writer's strike and just days before the beginning of the sag after actor strike. So as a result, for months, the cast was unable to do the sort of promotional events and interviews that one would hope to have when a movie came out. So the fact that it was successful, that it was the number one film on Amazon Prime for several weeks and has continued to be in the top 10 for months afterward, that is really remarkable considering that there was very little marketing campaign. And only months later after the strike was over was there sort of a rush of posts on social media from cast members and crew about making the movie and their experience. And you can see here, this is a still from a video that Taylor Zakar Perez posted of going with his parents to Times Square to see the billboard. There he is, you know, pointing himself out on the billboard. As for how this movie was received, it's very complex, and that's something I could get into a lot, but I'll only briefly touch on it. Critical reactions tended to be fairly positive, but very qualified, with a lot of condescending praise, right? It's, it's cute, it's corny, you know, endearing, but forgettable. There was a lot of praise for the main lead actors and their chemistry, and criticism for other aspects like, you know, flaws in the plot and the script, and especially for Uma Thurman's ridiculous Texas accent, which I would say, putting it generously, crosses over into camp. Audiences were much more enthusiastic, and that included most fans of the book, who often are very fierce fans of the book, and also a lot of other people like me who knew nothing about the book, but just enjoyed the movie and who embraced the romance and the positive message, which is unusual, you could say, in current cinema and also unusual in gay or LGBT cinema. Now, something I might as well just get out of the way right now, that is to say that I totally recognize, as basically anyone can, the serious flaws in this movie, the highly contrived premise, stilted lines, plot holes, and the very corny jokes, many of which are just not funny. Uh, that I think that all of those flaws are really obvious. I'm not here to deny them, and I'm not here to apologize for them. I'm not going to say, as some other fans do, oh, well, it's a rom-com, what do you expect? I think that this movie aims to be something much more complicated and rich than just a cute rom-com. I think in many ways it succeeds in that, but it still has these very serious flaws. Instead, I'm going to say, well, what does this movie have to offer and what can it reveal if we examine it more closely, if we do take it seriously, despite its sort of unserious appearance and trappings? So another major point that a lot of commentators, both critics and lay people, talked about about this movie is the depiction of sex. So sex is important in this movie. I'm going to talk about it somewhat delicately as best I can for YouTube, but it is important. It comes in early in the story, which is unusual and noteworthy for a rom-com. It is not saved up to the end. It comes in fairly early in the plot. And specifically, there is a sex scene that takes place in a hotel in Paris, and it's around the middle of the movie. And many people have pointed out not only how artistic and intimate and tender this sex scene is, but also how realistic it is. And I will say that is one of many things that jumped out at me about this movie. This is, I would say, the most realistic, most accurate depiction of gay sex I've seen on screen anywhere. And that in itself, I think, is worthy of some comment and reflection, right? That this supposedly stilted fairy tale wish fulfillment fantasy movie in some ways actually contains exceptionally realistic material in it. I didn't know anything about that scene going in and that is not what I saw people talking about and discussing initially when I first found out about this movie. Rather, 
The scene that really made the rounds and has become kind of iconic from this movie is this one. This is a still from the so-called lake or dock scene. This one created a lot of conversation. People posted about it on Twitter and other platforms, commenting on the bizarre contrast between the expressions, the moods, and even the acting styles of the two actors in this scene. Some people assumed that this represented a difference in quality in acting, right? And people said things like, you know, why does Taylor look like he's in a Lifetime movie and Nicholas looks like he's in Macbeth? And I think one even, you know, commenting on on his expression said, why does he look like he just realized the horror of the atom bomb? Now, of course, people who've watched the movie through will know that this is an intentional contrast and it reflects a dramatic irony where the two characters have very different feelings about the progression of their relationship. And this is one point in the movie where, and there are others, where Henry turns away from Alex and we see his face and we see the complex interplay, the conflicting emotions on his face and Alex does not. And this is one of many ways that the movie creates dramatic tension and irony when we understand certain things going on in characters' minds that the other characters around them don't. So that was enough to get me intrigued, and I was really surprised when I learned that, that, that this scene was from Red, White, and Royal Blue because I had seen marketing posters and images for the movie, and I thought they looked unbearably cheesy, and that certainly, if I watched the movie, it would make me nauseous. But nonetheless, I decided to give it a try. I thought, well, maybe it's fun, maybe it's cute, maybe it's sexy, right? I was intrigued enough to watch. And watching it, I found that all of those things are true. It is fun, it's cute, it's sexy. It is also unbearably cheesy and did make me nauseous at points. But certain things stood out to me. There were other scenes that were intriguing in similar sorts of ways, where you could see this strange ironic contrast, for one thing, between the vibrant, idyllically beautiful environments that these characters were moving in and the sort of misery that they were experiencing inside. It was enough to make me think that there was something more going on and to want to look back at some of those scenes and comb through them for something more. And I found that I enjoyed the movie more the second time and then more the third and the fourth and so on until I lost count of how many times I had watched it. This was not an unusual experience, it seems. If you look at the many fan accounts, the comments, the posts about this movie, a very common theme is people boast about how many times they've watched it. They've watched it 20 times, 30 times. They rewatch it every week. They rewatch it every day. This sense, I think, is captured pretty well by a thread on Twitter by a, an account called Pyramus underscore Thisbe. This person wrote, quote, I don't think any movie touched me the way Red, White, and Royal Blue did. There's so much layers in it that you keep discovering even months later. And then they go on, quote, analyzing my favorite movies is my favorite thing. And I don't think I've ever analyzed something as much as I did with Red, White, and Royal Blue, and it's just a two-hour movie. Now, one could say that these are just sort of insane lowbrow fans who are charmed by the pretty faces, the romance. Fair enough, but I am here to say there is much more going on here, and there are reasons that need to be investigated why this movie is so compelling to certain people and why it not only holds up to repeated viewing, but rewards careful examination and analysis. And if we look at the movie reviewing website Letterboxd, Red, White, and Royal Blue does not appear at the top of the list of highest reviewed movies in any category for 2023. However, if we look at the list of top 10 most rewatched movies of 2023, this one comes in at number three after only Barbie and the Spider-Man movie and ahead of Oppenheimer. So I think there is a disjuncture here that in and of itself requires explanation. So I think there is a real disjuncture here between sort of right-thinking highbrow opinion that this is just a throwaway piece of light entertainment 
and this widespread reaction of fascination and obsession. And I think that there are good explanations for this that lie in the hidden and encoded layers of this movie. I would speculate that this movie may actually be, in a sense, the first of its kind, the first of a new sort of film, which is specifically made for streaming rather than for theatrical release. And the fact that it's made for streaming means that viewers are able to rewatch an unlimited number of times at their leisure, and hence very subtle encoded meanings and references can be woven in with the hope that viewers will find them, that they will be seen and, and understood at some point. And I think that that's what the movie makers did here. And partly that is also a function of the adaptation process. So as I said, it's a very long book that is very rich and layered. One can see how the basic plot line is highly contrived, right? It's an escapist fantasy, a romance between the son of the U.S. president and a British prince. Yet in the richness and detail, these characters do, I think, begin to come to life and take on a multidimensional form. Then when it was adapted into a movie, all of that material had to be somehow distilled down into not only the film medium, but into only two hours. And the movie makers, I think, went about this in a very conscious and intentional way, working in layers often of metaphor and allusion that in the book are more explicit, where in the movie they become more subtle and more implicit. It's kind of the opposite of how we tend to think of the relationship between books and movies. So for this reason, I think rewatching and analyzing and trying to understand this movie and the things it conveys is fun, it's rewarding, and it's revealing. So this sort of analysis can be revealing for one thing, just in terms of how the characters are constructed. And while this is clearly an escapist fantasy, it's highly contrived, I would argue that the main characters of Alex and Henry actually do come to life as remarkably vivid and convincing real characters. When I try to describe this movie, it brings to mind a famous poem by the poet Marianne Moore, who wrote a poem simply called Poetry, where she starts off by saying, I too dislike it. It all seems wasteful, frivolous, and yet... Within all of that, you can find things that are genuine and that speak to you as real, just as much as in other more technical, realistic forms of text, like census reports. And she has this famous line where she says, what poetry offers is, quote, imaginary gardens with real toads in them. So on one level, you can see this movie as presenting an imaginary garden with two remarkably real toads in it, right? Alex and Henry. But aside from that, it also, I think, is a meditation, sometimes intentional and sometimes completely unintentional, on, as I said, morality, sex, politics in our own world. So what I want to do now, just in the rest of this introductory video, is just briefly point out a few of the sort of contexts in which this movie can be seen as significant and meaningful. And then lastly, give a couple of examples of highly crafted, highly conscious symbolism and subtext that is worked into this movie to sort of show that I'm serious, right? Fire a warning shot, show that I'm serious. And then I'll save the rest of that to the later videos, which I'll sort of briefly forecast at the end. So one fairly obvious context in which Red, White, and Royal Blue is an unusual and distinctive movie is simply as a gay romance. And it can be seen as significant, firstly, just in the LGBT context. And I'll address that now and hopefully get it out of the way so we don't have to dwell on it. But it's significant that there are distinctive challenges that gay romances have to face that set them apart from heterosexual romances. One of them is the fact that a gay or lesbian romance cannot rely upon gender difference as a source of tension and friction. And that's, of course, one of the great common themes of romantic comedies. Two lovers come together, but there's tension and confusion 
because they have different perspectives and sensibilities. One is a man and the other is a woman. Well, obviously, a gay and lesbian romance can't do that. And that creates a challenge where in order to be compelling and to have that kind of tension, the romance really has to effectively develop and emphasize the different personalities and different worldviews of the two lovers. Without that, it's going to fall flat. So you have to have a certain degree of psychological complexity and psychological realism to really make for a compelling story. So there's a higher hurdle there. But then that leads to a further challenge, which is what does it mean to make a movie realistic? If you try to develop that psychological realism, then you have to ask, well, what about the social realism of the social context around these lovers. You have to acknowledge that homosexuality is controversial. It's been a subject of dispute. There are problems of law and family formation and discrimination. And so there's this constant question of how much do you address and include those things in the story? How much do you need those things in the story in order for it to be serious to be compelling. And if you bring those things in, at what point do they then overwhelm the actual core of the story, which is simply the love story, right? The charm, the fun, the attraction of the romance itself. So it makes for a very difficult balancing act that I think very few movie makers have gotten right. And it's interesting, I think, to have that in mind when you look at this movie, Red, White, and Royal Blue, and consider how they tried to strike that balance and maybe to what degree they were successful. Now, probably a lot of you know that there is a long tradition of LGBT films and specifically of LGBT movies going back at least to the 1970s that try to strike a balance between a personal story, a sort of fun comic story of personalities on the one hand with a sort of social realism on the other and political, more, you could say, serious political themes on the other. And you might think of classic movies like The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and The Birdcage, both of which came out in the 90s, which try to sort of strike that balance. They are about LGBT life and all the problems and conflicts that come with it at the same time that they're fun, light, funny. Uh, but obviously these are not romances. That balance I don't think has really been struck effectively in a romance movie. Now, over about the past 30 years, there has been a proliferation of gay and lesbian romances. So this is now a genre that many people have seen, including many straight people, right? And they've gained a wider audience. But as gay fans will tell you, of course, they overwhelmingly tend to be tragic. In order to be seen as a serious movie or a movie with appeal beyond the, the gay audience, they basically always end in tragedy. One or both lovers often die. That is the case with, of course, Brokeback Mountain, the first successful wide release Hollywood movie about a gay couple. It's also true in a different way of many other more sort of arty LGBT movies, like the recent lesbian romance Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and the very good uh, British gay romance Weekend from 2011, which is a good movie that I like. But these movies too, although the lovers may not die, there is always something built into the premise that ensures that they will not end up together. Some inevitability at work from the beginning that means that the story will end with a parting. And I think that there's a problem at work here. There's a sort of assumption that lingers on that gay love is inherently tragic or that it has to be tragic in order to be taken seriously. And that a sort of gay love affair that ends up with a happy ending or with the lovers together is somehow too frivolous and can't have meaning beyond puerile enjoyment of a limited audience. Now, there have, of course, been efforts in recent years to move beyond this and to create fun, happy, romantic stories about gay couples with varying degrees of success. You may have heard of the gay romantic comedy Bros, which was made by Billy Eichner, which, you know, is about different clashing personalities 
and it's supposed to be light and fun and appealing to a broad audience. It doesn't seem it did so. It was a flop. I haven't watched it. I can't speak to whether it's good. But I do know that it not only did it not make back its production budget, it actually didn't make back even its marketing budget. So maybe, it, you know, the characters, the story somehow were not compelling. It lacked maybe a fantasy element. I don't know. There are also recent ongoing television series that often deal with gay romance and love that are often very, you know, cute and sappy uh, that appeal to a lot of the same audience as Red, White, and Royal Blue, such as Heartstopper. Another one is Young Royals. And these take place in high schools uh, and deal with teenagers. That's fine if that's what you want to watch, but it's really a different beast from Red, White, and Royal Blue. So what is different about this movie? A number of things. One is that they're grown adults. You know, it's a cute, sappy, fun, romantic comedy. It's all of those things. But it is about grown adults with more mature, complex personalities dealing with complex adult problems. And this is actually a difference from the book, partially, because in the book, Alex and Henry are... 21 and 22 years old when the story begins. Alex is in college. In the movie, they're aged up. Alex is in law school, and it seems from clues in the movie that they're maybe in about their mid to late 20s. So this gives it a different kind of mood and weight. And I think that, as I'm going to try to say and demonstrate, they do give remarkable psychological depth to these characters. And they also tackle this question of how do you how do you balance the central story of the love story with some sort of social and political context different people may feel differently about how successful that was but also i think unlike these other sort of cute romances like bros or heartstopper red white and royal blue tries to strike a careful balance between the cute and fun aspect of the romance and the darker aspects. There is, I would say, a, a serious dark aspect to this movie. For one thing, I think if you watch very closely, the character of Henry actually looms forth as a remarkably tormented figure. And again, that's something that may not strike you right away. It doesn't come through in the marketing. But it does come through if you watch closely his behavior. There is a real dark aspect there. And this, again, reminds me of It's a Wonderful Life, and I'll make that comparison once again, where that too is a movie that often is seen as just sort of corny, sappy entertainment, but which I think continues to be compelling and absorbing, partly because there are really chilling aspects. There is, for one thing, the pretty harrowing depiction of George Bailey's distress and feeling of being constrained, constricted, suffocated in his life that's been assigned to him, very similarly to Henry and his feelings in the royal family. And even more than that, there is the sequence of Pottersville. Henry in Red, White, and Royal Blue at one point sort of laments his constrained life. And he says, you know, who would you be if you were just an anonymous person in the world? And in It's a Wonderful Life, we see George Bailey having similar feelings. And he has this vision where he gets that. He his life, his identity are taken away from him. He becomes nobody. And he sees what the world is like under those different conditions. And the sequence of Pottersville, I think, is very chilling, for one thing, because of what it represents to George. But also, I think it's chillingly prophetic, provides this vision of how easily life can be coarsened, commodified, commercialized, in a way that strangely foresees where I think we are in the 21st century. And I think that's part of why it continues to be a powerful movie. And similarly, I think Red, White, and Royal Blue tries, and I would say successfully, tries to strike this balance and to make the sappiness, the sentimentalism of the story still work because there is this acknowledgement of a much darker side as well. And I think that the proof of that success, ironically, is in the criticisms that have been made of Red, White, and Royal Blue, where on the one hand, many people criticize it by saying it's formulaic, right? Or they, they condescend to it, saying, well, it's formulaic. It's just a 
rehashing of the enemies to lovers trope. I don't think that's true. I think that that only describes about the first 30 minutes of the movie, right? And past that, it becomes a much more complicated story. But then on the other hand, other critics say, well, it's tonally inconsistent. It's hard to tell what sort of movie it's supposed to be. And I think that's ironic. I think these are contradictory criticisms, right? On the one hand, you know what to expect. It's all obvious. It's all there built into the premise. And then on the other hand, as you watch it, it becomes something quite different. And I think that what happens for some viewers is that this change in tone and atmosphere through the movie works. And the corniness and the darkness complement and speak to one another. As I'm going to argue, this movie... Its tone, its style, its form reflects the personalities of the main characters, and the movie changes as the characters change. And hopefully I'll describe later how that happens. So for all of these reasons, I think that this movie, it tackles and at least to some degree succeeds in overcoming these special challenges of a gay romance and creates something distinctive and alive. Now, let's say we put that aside. The other way that one can see the significance of this movie in context that I'm more interested in and will develop more later is to see it as allegorical, as making some sort of statement or reflection on, for one thing, the international theme, right? The relationship between Britain and America or between Europe and America. And this international theme, this phrase is used to describe a sort of variety of literature that sprang up and became popular in the early 1900s. Masters of this genre are Edith Wharton and Henry James. And that was a time when America was first rising and becoming a world power. And there was a lot at stake, a lot of questions at stake about how this new rising nation would relate to the old world. My personal favorite novel is The Age of Innocence, which is partly on this theme. And you can see here a still on the left from the Martin Scorsese film adaptation of The Age of Innocence with Daniel Day-Lewis with his face buried pretty deeply in the folds of Michelle Pfeiffer's skirt. And on the right, that's a still from The Golden Bowl by Henry James, which was made into a movie in 2000 starring none other than Uma Thurman. Literature on the international theme tends to deal with sort of one side upsetting or corrupting the other. Often it's a sort of innocent, naive American being taken in and corrupted by decadent Europeans, or sometimes the reverse of innocent Europeans being sort of swindled by striving, grasping, ambitious, social climbing Americans. Often it's a sort of comment on the, the changing world scene and the changing relationship between these countries. And with Red, Red, and World Blue, we can see this story as kind of coming at the other end of the arc, right? Now that America's position in the world is very much in question and there's anxiety about supposed American decline. And I think a lot of the, the love affair between Alex and Henry can be seen, again, as a, a largely unconscious meditation about America, what kind of country it is, and where it stands in the world. Now, more specifically, of course, Alex and Henry, they're not just representatives of their nations. They're representative of their nation's governments. And they can be seen to stand in, in many ways, for a monarchy and liberal democracy and the sort of tension and push and pull between monarchy and liberal democracy. And I think that this movie is part of a trend that I have described in my writing as pop culture royalism, a sort of rising fascination with the mystery, the magic of monarchy, and a sort of desire to borrow that sense of mystery and majesty to renew the mystique of the American Republic. And of course, you know, there's this fascination with the actual British royal family as reflected in The Crown and other series like Victoria and also in sort of monarchy in general and the, the, the magic of monarchy, like, of course, in Game of Thrones, the movie Black Panther, royalism and kingship have become sort of mainstay themes now of mass pop culture. And in that context, you can see Red, White, and Royal Blue is very revealing because it is about an American 
who is part of the so-called first family, who lives in the White House, who engages in this gay affair with a, a British royal. It comes at a time when both of those institutions, the British monarchy and the American presidency, are in a kind of crisis of legitimacy, where the rising generation in Britain does not take the monarchy seriously anymore. It's seen as outmoded, stuffy. It's referred to repeatedly in the movie as antiquated. So there's this looming crisis of legitimacy on that side. And then on the other, with the American presidency, there is wide disillusionment in the contemporary U.S. with all kinds of traditional longstanding institutions. The presidency is only one of them, but especially for the sort of segment of the population that this movie is aimed at, there's a, particularly a crisis as a result of Trump, right? And the sense that the White House, the presidency have been somehow sullied. There's been a disenchantment because of this vulgarization resulting from Trump. And in this way, I think you can see this special relationship, right, <laughs> between Alex and Henry, this gay affair that links the British monarchy with the White House, you can see this as a sort of effort by the authors and the movie makers to save both institutions by linking them together in this affair, to, in a sense, update and modernize the British monarchy to make it somehow cooler, freer, more authentic by means of a gay affair and the American presidency by linking it to the British monarchy and to re-enchant the American presidency by means of the royal touch, the magic of the royal touch, right? And that's a long-standing belief, or you could say superstition, in the old world that the king is a sort of magical entity and that his touch can heal. If you're suffering from something like scrofula, the king would touch you, and that was believed to have a healing power. And in this way, I think this movie is sort of borrowing the magic of the royal touch to kind of heal and re-enchant American institutions. So that I'll get into when I talk about the political ideology of the movie. So now, finally, although this has been a long video, of course, I'd like to get lastly into a bit of the fun part. So I've said repeatedly already that there's a dense web of subtext and metaphor and allusion that can be uncovered and excavated out of this movie. And I'm gonna talk about that a lot coming up but I'd like to now just briefly point out two things that I think are especially interesting and revealing and demonstrate what I'm talking about. And the first one is just the first moment, the first shot that appeared in the movie that struck me and that made me sit up straight in my seat and say, I need to pay close attention to this. So as you know, the movie starts off with scenes outside Buckingham Palace. We see a receiving line where Alex and Henry are talking smack about each other behind one another's backs. You know, he's the world's rudest person. He's the world's most irritating person. And it culminates with Henry openly snubbing Alex. And that's all sort of cute and corny, formulaic. And then from there, it cuts to the first scene where we see Alex inside Buckingham Palace in the ballroom. And it looks like this. Now, you may not be surprised to learn this is not really Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace doesn't look like this. It's much more understated. This actually, with some searching, I found this actually is Goldsmiths Hall, the hall belonging to the livery company or guild of goldsmiths in the city of London. It is even more opulent and extravagant than the state ballroom or dining room in Buckingham. And you can see it makes heavy use of gilding, dominating the whole scene. This shot really stood out to me because I think of how much it communicated so dramatically. So we see just to the right of the center of the frame, the figure of Alex, really dwarfed by these massive architectural forms all around him and the vibrancy and opulence of this environment. And he looks out of place, a bit overwhelmed. He's probably accustomed to being the bell of the ball. And here he is now very out of place. And he's trying to compensate, right? His posture is ramrod straight. He has his chest puffed out and he's clutching his glass of whiskey. That in itself introduces so many themes that then recur over and over again and are referred back to throughout the movie. The importance of interior architecture, 
the importance of alcohol as a social crutch and a compensation for anxiety. And I came to see this shot as sort of the establishing shot of the whole movie, even though it slipped in so briefly, it's only on screen for about four seconds. And what's more is on the left side of the frame, we of course see the scene of the wedding reception itself reflected in this enormous wall mirror. And that allows us to see Alex himself and his expression and his body language and what he's looking at both at the same time. And if we look over his shoulder, we see his reflection and we see the direction he's facing in. And the way the shot is set up, we can even tell very precisely exactly what he's looking at. If you look right into the center of that reflected scene, there is the figure of Henry. He is looking at Henry with this kind of pained expression, right? Fascination, anger, resentment. This sets up, I think, a lot of how we are supposed to experience the movie. We observe Henry through Alex's eyes, and there are so many scenes where we see him watching Henry from afar, as if studying him. And at the same time, we see Alex and we see how he is revealed to us through his obsession with Henry. And specifically, when I looked back at this shot, it reminded me of shots I've seen in other particular movies, most especially the one that came to my mind is the Alfred Hitchcock film Vertigo from 1958, which begins with a private investigator played by Jimmy Stewart, who is commissioned and who reluctantly accepts a commission to follow and investigate a woman named Madeline, a sort of society matron in San Francisco. He follows her around, studies her activities, and is able to piece together that she's living a kind of double life, that she sees herself as having a sort of alternate identity. There's one particular shot, which is this one, where we see that Scotty has followed Madeline to a flower shop, and he snuck into the storeroom, and we can see him peeking out and spying on her, while at the same time in the mirror next to him, we see what he is seeing, and we get this double vision, very much like in that dramatic shot in Red, White, and Royal Blue. And I think that these sort of resonances and allusions invite us to see the movie Red, White, and Royal Blue as a kind of mystery, where Alex is functioning as, however incompetently, as a kind of investigator who, like Scotty in Vertigo, is obsessed with his subject, is drawn in to their strange Hall of Mirrors world, and who discovers that the person he's obsessed with is living a sort of double life and has a double identity. And that eventually is made explicit in the movie. So this is, I think, one of the subtle devices, right? The shot itself is not subtle, but it's so brief, it's only on screen about four seconds. But it's one of these hints that prompts us for how to watch the movie and how to question it, to look at it with curiosity, to look for hidden layers, hidden realities. So lastly now, with that in mind, I'd like to talk about one fairly minor character (laughs) who I think has an incredible amount of symbolism and reference bound up in that one figure. And this is a minor character in the sense that he only appears briefly on screen twice, and he actually has no speaking lines. And yet he's referred to a number of times and alluded to as somehow symbolically important, and I would venture to guess that he's probably some fan's favorite character. So many of you have probably already guessed I'm speaking about Henry's dog named David. So as soon as the dog showed up in this story, I felt that I should pay close attention to him and that he was likely to be symbolically significant. For one thing, because dogs are traditionally associated with royalty, and there's a long tradition of depicting kings and emperors with their dogs, especially hunting dogs and guard dogs, as symbols of their royal status, their authority. Here you see on the left, this is a depiction of King Harold Godwinson of England with his hunting dogs in the Bayeux Tapestry. And on the right is a painting of Emperor Charles V with his dog. And you see this motif over and over again. Some dogs are named after the kings and queens associated with them. And this continues right up into recent times. You might think of Queen Elizabeth II and her famous corgis. The dog also is a symbol of fidelity and loyalty. 
and hence in royal portraiture it can be used to represent the relationship of mutual loyalty between the ruler and his subjects. And in particular, the movie made me think of a traditional motif seen especially in France of depicting kings and queens in their effigy tombs, right, their places of burial, reclining in bed with a dog or two dogs at their feet, symbolizing protection, guardianship, and loyalty. And the second point where we see David appear in the movie, he's in bed next to Henry, and it's very reminiscent of these traditional royal effigy sculptures. So all of these things made me think that I ought to pay attention when the characters talk about David. And in particular, you may remember, ongoing question about the dog is about his name. Why is he named David? This seems odd and unusual for a dog to have such a typically human name, right? It's not like Baxter or Rex or that sort of thing. And the question first comes up in the scene on the airplane when Alex is flying to London in order to meet with Henry and pretend to be his friend. And he's going with his bodyguard, Amy, and they are practicing the fact sheet that Alex has to memorize about Henry. And the dog comes up. What's the name of Henry's dog? David. <laughs> I mean, really, who names their dog David? You know I have a shih tzu named Jonathan. Yeah, I still maintain that's weird. So as you can see, right from the beginning, there is confusion and clashing views about the significance of the dog's name. So to Alex, he says this is weird, and we can basically infer what he's thinking. He has described Henry as a snob, as entitled, smug, so he probably sees naming the dog David as a sign of Henry being stuffy, pretentious, right? A typical aristocrat. Now, Immediately, as soon as he brings up this view, we get pushback from Amy. She sees it in almost, you could say, the opposite way. So Amy points out rather indignantly that she has a dog named Jonathan, right? So she maybe sympathizes or empathizes with Henry naming his dog David. But what does that mean to her? Well, we don't really understand. We only get a further interpretation, a counter-interpretation of the meaning of the name when Alex digs in his heels and Amy has to respond further. So let's see what happens there. You know I have a shih tzu named Jonathan. Yeah, I still maintain that's weird. That's my son you're talking about. He is super cute. Amy, because Alex digs in his heels and says it's still weird, Amy has to further explain and she says... That's my son you're talking about. So here we see she is anthropomorphizing her dog. She's talking about her dog, Jonathan, as if he was a human family member. And that goes hand in hand with her giving the dog a human name. So thus, by analogy and by inference, we can say Amy is presenting a very different understanding of the meaning of David's name, that from her perspective, it represents something like the opposite, not that he is stuffy or pretentious, but that he has an especially close bond with the dog, that he anthropomorphizes the dog and sees the dog as a human-like companion. And if we further combine that with what we know about the symbolism of dogs in, in art and their association with royalty, we can say that there's an alternate meaning here. Henry actually sees David as a human-like companion and guardian. And that's underscored then later when we see Henry's bedroom. And over the two sides of his bed are these portraits of dogs in human clothing and human poses. So they're anthropomorphized. And furthermore, they're placed on either side of his bed, almost in the position of guardians watching over him. So here we have two very dramatically clashing meanings to David's name. On the one hand, there's Alex's presumptive meaning, which is Henry is stuffy and pretentious. And then we get this contrary meaning suggested by Amy, that Henry sees David like a human companion and guardian. In this way, it seems as if David the dog is playing a sort of substitute role in Henry's life. He's being cast in the role of a companion, a guardian, a protector that Henry lacks, especially since the death of his father, which is also alluded to in this same conversation on the plane. So there's a lot at stake here in what we understand about Henry, how he operates, what sort of person he is. Now, that's two meanings. 
there's then a third meaning, which is very subtly alluded to in, again, in this same conversation. But it's a meaning that the characters in the world of the story couldn't possibly see or know about, but that is hinted at to us in the audience. So remember, Amy says that her dog is named Jonathan. So we have two dogs named David and Jonathan. Now, as I remembered after the second or third time watching the movie, and as some other fans have pointed out, David and Jonathan are a biblical, same-sex, intimate couple. The story of King David before he was king and his intimate relationship with Jonathan is recounted in the first book of Samuel. These two are described as very emotionally and physically intimate. There are passages describing them embracing, kissing, weeping together, declaring their love for one another. What is more, David shows interesting parallels to the story of Red, White, and Royal Blue. So Jonathan was a prince in the sense that he was the eldest son of King Saul, the first king of the Israelites. And as such, you could call him, although they didn't use these terms at the time, you could call him the crown prince, the heir to the throne. He falls in love with and forms a bond with David, who at that point in time was not a king. He was just an ordinary shepherd's son. So he came from a, an ordinary low status background. And he rose to prominence as a warrior and war commander. He had to, unlike Jonathan, he had to prove himself. And you can see parallels here, of course, to the story of Henry and Alex, right? The, the prince Henry and Alex, who describes himself as an ordinary working class kid and who's very determined to take on challenges and prove himself in the world. And also, for what it's worth... David is described in the Bible repeatedly as very handsome and as a sort of uh, exemplar of male beauty. And that's a major reason why Michelangelo spent so much time and effort in his grand sculpture of David as sort of presenting him as a paragon of male beauty. And furthermore, he's marked out by his distinctive features of curly hair and enormous hands, which may look familiar again to fans of the movie. Now, more specifically, in 1 Samuel 18, we have a passage describing David and Jonathan forming a berit, or what can be called a covenant or a sworn bond. And this passage reads, quote, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. So, you know, many people have seen this passage as having some erotic suggestion to it, but it's also very important that Jonathan seals this covenant, this bond with David by the giving of gifts, and most especially his robe and his sword are symbols of his royal position and his claim as successor to the throne. And he is conferring or sharing this royal status with David by giving him these symbolic gifts. Probably many of you have already inferred, you can see here a prefiguring of the scene where Alex and Henry seal their bond with one another through an exchange of symbolic gifts, and it begins with Henry giving Alex his signet ring, the symbol of his royal position. So what do we make of all of this? Well, in this way, you can see a biblical allusion coded into this same conversation in which the biblical meaning of David's name is invoked and used prophetically to foreshadow that Alex and Henry are going to be joined together in a bond, and that in this way, Alex is going to take David's place. And so you can add this on to your list of meanings, right? Here's our third meaning. So there's Alex's meaning, Henry is stuffy and pretentious. Amy's meaning, Henry sees David like a human companion and guardian. And then through this biblical allusion, it's foreshadowed that actually Henry will gain a real human companion and guardian of the sort that he needs in the person of Alex. Okay, is that all? No, there's still more. <laughs> so lastly, there's a fourth meaning to David's name. So the subject comes up again later in the phone call scene where Alex calls Henry late at night and Henry says that he's staying up late in bed with his dog watching Bake Off. So right off from the beginning of the conversation, the dog is alluded to and brought to mind again. And Alex remarks that Henry seems much more normal and human than he would have thought. And he again brings up the subject of David's name. 
So let's see now briefly the beginning of that exchange where David is brought up again. You're more of a human than I thought. Wow, thank you, Alex. That is so flattering. No, I just mean, you don't seem like the kind of person that would name their dog David. He's named after Bowie. Okay, so now we've gotten another meaning of the name. It's after David Bowie. So this indicates that Henry is a fan of David Bowie. Shouldn't be too surprising, right? A British rocker, very popular. And furthermore, it's already been suggested to us because earlier in the movie, when Alex gets to Kensington Palace to see Henry, Henry comes tearing up the driveway in another scene with multiple allusions and meanings to it. But he comes tearing up the driveway, blasting a David Bowie song, specifically Up the Hill Backwards. The song sounds fun. It's upbeat. But there's also an oddity to it as well, because this song, Up the Hill Backwards, is a very unusual and relatively obscure choice. It is by no means among Bowie's top hits. It was never near the top of the charts. David Bowie never played it in concert. It's a song that most casual fans don't know, and really only aficionados talk about this song and sometimes comment that it's it's interesting, it's strange, it's complex, it has multiple changing time signatures, and the lyrics are very obscure and oblique. And one could go into the, the possible strange meanings and subtexts of this song, but without getting into that, the fact that that's what we hear Henry playing is itself indicative. It shows that Henry is not just a casual rock fan who happens to like David Bowie. He's a real aficionado who is probably very deep into his body of work. And so it's not surprising that Henry would uh, name his dog after David Bowie. So we can add here on finally a fourth meaning to the name. And Alex remarks that Henry has surprisingly cool taste. This is much more cool and hip than Alex would have expected. And again, it's almost a perfect reverse of Alex's initial perception that that the dog's name means Henry is stuffy and pretentious. But there's still a strange question here, right? Which is, if all of this is true, then why is the dog named David, this name that doesn't provide any clear indication of where it came from, from David Bowie? So let's see what happens here after Alex makes this remark. What is the follow-up exchange? He's named after Bowie. Wait, seriously? Hmm. That's way cooler. Why not just call him Bowie then? It's a bit on the nose, don't you think? So here is one instance where Alex actually asks an astute question, right? Why not call him Bowie? And Henry reacts in a very characteristic way. And at first he thinks, and then he deflects. So he says, that would be a bit on the nose, which is a very odd and ambiguous response when you think about it. What does that mean for something to be on the nose. Well, often it's defined, like if you look in a dictionary, it's defined in a very simple way. It just means too obvious. But for one thing, really, that's not actually how people use it. It has a much more specific and narrow meaning. It's used when someone says something too explicitly that is in some way awkward or uncomfortable, and that should be left unspoken. That's how I would describe it. I put out to my followers on Twitter, how, what do you take it to mean when someone says something is too on the nose or a bit on the nose? And one of my followers made a very nice response where he said, it means, quote, when a euphemism is expected, but instead the actual meaning is laid out clearly. So it's uncomfortable in some way or inappropriate when something is too on the nose. You're supposed to keep certain things beneath the surface, unspoken, unacknowledged, or use a veiled euphemism. So Henry's response in this way indicates that that's what he's doing. He doesn't want to reveal clearly that he's a big fan of David Bowie. He wants to use somehow an oblique or veiled reference. Why would Henry want to do that? At first, of course, I was very dumb and didn't understand. And finally, I saw a discussion in a YouTube comment section where someone pointed out, well, of course he doesn't, because David Bowie was famously openly bisexual and cultivated a kind of androgynous or genderqueer persona. So naturally, Henry doesn't want to call too much attention and associate himself too much with a figure like David Bowie. And so he's using this veiled oblique reference. So what does all of this mean? Well, 
as I've said before, this movie reflects the personalities of the main characters, both Alex and Henry. And we have to understand both dimensions of the movie. So on the one hand, this is very much Alex's movie. It is expressive, demonstrative, often corny, uncouth, and it moves at a frenetic pace. In all of these ways, it reflects Alex's personality. And all of that, I think, is is fairly obvious. At the same time, it is also Henry's movie. It reflects Henry's personality. The fact that it presents a glossy, overly perfect manicured veneer under which are layers and undercurrents that are kept often hidden and only hinted at through very careful, oblique metaphors, references, subtext. So gays and lesbians have historically been masters of code and double meanings, and Henry in many ways personifies that history. And the theme also pervades the whole movie, as can be seen even in the title, Red, White, and Royal Blue, which points to how the same symbol, this set of three colors, can represent both the American flag and the Union Jack, and hence can stand for completely different things for different audiences. And these multiple meanings always have to be disentangled and decoded. And again, part of how the movie works is we are invited into the role of Alex. And in some ways, we are invited to be smarter and quicker than Alex is, to investigate, to understand, to observe Henry and the multiple realities of Henry as Alex discovers them, right? And as Alex changes and evolves as he comes to discover and understand Henry. So that is the sort of investigation and analysis that I'm hoping to do and that I'm hoping viewers will come along and participate in with me. My hope is to produce five more short videos, hopefully shorter than this one, on different aspects and dimensions of the movie. So this is my projected possible series. Firstly, part one, we really need to get you a book on English history, the historical context of Red, White, and Royal Blue. Part two, occasionally vulgar but genuine, the romance of Red, White, and Royal Blue. Part three, you still haven't noticed my tie, the visual and symbolic language of Red, White, and Royal Blue. Fourth, I do not need a lecture from you about idealism, the political ideology of Red, White, and Royal Blue. And part five, it means you have good taste, Red, White, and Royal Blue, and genre, taste, and aesthetics. So if you enjoyed this or if you hope to see more of this, please share spread the word. And lastly, I'd like to thank the various people who helped and contributed to making this video possible, including those who gave advice about programs and platforms to use, such as my producer Dan Rogers, the filmmaker Lily Dickinson, and the YouTuber Ethan Clark, who has made really wonderful reaction and commentary videos about Red, White, and Royal Blue, both the book and the movie, and I'll link to his channel in the description. Also, the classical musician, Marco Cera, who gave permission to use clips from his performance of Schaffe Kunin Zecher Weiden, and I'll link to his channel as well, so you can see his videos. And the Red, White, and Royal Blue fan community. As I mentioned in the video, some of these observations and points about the film I noticed myself, others I was guided to by other fans on Twitter and YouTube and other platforms. So thank you so much to the whole fan community. And finally, thank you to the 300 plus patrons of Historians Explaining, A Historian Tells You Why Everything You Know Is Wrong, who have made it possible to keep this podcast going for years and made it possible to start this video series. Thank you.